Pastor Darrell for that prayer. And uh, we want to take our Bibles this morning. And our text is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the resurrection chapter in the Bible. So let me ask you this Easter question. That is, does the resurrection of Jesus Christ really make a difference in your life? Now, 78% of the people in a survey taken, 78% of the people in America say they believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. But does it really make a difference in our lives? Rollo May, in his book, My Quest for Beauty, tells a story about going into a church in Greece during the Easter season. And the pastor would say, at one point of the message, he said, uh, Christ is risen. And the response from the crowd would be, he is risen indeed. And he said, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And back and forth it went. It built up to a crescendo. He got really involved in it. And he thought to himself, and I quote this, I was seized by the spiritual reality. What would it mean for our world if he had truly risen? Well, I know what it's meant to the world, but what does it mean to you today? How are you embracing the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Now, we can talk about the egg hunt yesterday, and you're, you're here together, maybe some of you, with your family. It's a family time. Maybe you're thinking, wow, you know, it's Easter, like kind of a light message today. Maybe you'd like to hear just some good thought for the day or something I can use during the week or even the coming year, but nothing really heavy. But here's the problem. The message of the resurrection is the most, not only the most powerful, but the most meaningful message in the Bible. The whole church was started on this message. Now, as we celebrate it today, the question still remains, are you embracing that? Does it really make a difference in your life? What, what should it make in your life? And before we even answer all that, we probably need to ask ourselves the question, what happened on that day? And then, did it really happen? And finally, so what? The final point that I'm going to get back to in just a moment. So what? That Jesus Christ did rise from the dead. Well, first of all, let me just say that the typical person, uh, probably in America, in the Western civilization, that does not believe in the bodily resurrection of Christ would say something like this. I've heard this rendition of this many, many times. Well, what happened in the Bible was that biblical times was actually this. What happened was these people followed around the historical figure, Jesus, and he did a lot of good things. But after he died, they began to tell stories of the miracles and embellish those stories. And then over centuries and passing down from generation to generation, these stories just got embellished. Finally, it became a legend. And 500 years after it happened, they wrote all these things down. So you really can't believe a word of it. Now, that may make sense to you. The problem is this. None of that happened. None of it. Even historically, apart from the Bible, none of that happened. What we're about to look at today are eyewitness of the accounts. 15 years after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, this book was written. We can trace all the way down through the early centuries these actual types of manuscripts written pointing to the book of 1 Corinthians. In chapter 15, the longest chapter, the most thorough teaching of the resurrection of Christ. And the irony to it all is that the church at Corinth never doubted Jesus' resurrection. They doubted their own resurrection. And they were afraid they were not going to be risen from the dead on the last day. And in getting to that point, around chapter uh, 15, chapter, verses 20, 22, getting to that point, he builds up an argument for the actual risen Christ that we're going to be looking at this morning. So I want to look at those three things, three basic questions. What happened, real quickly? Did it happen? Spend a little bit more time on that. And finally, so what, now that it has happened? First of all, what happened? Look in verse 1. Now I could remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you. Now, this word preach means to herald something. It, and it's important as we look to this passage about preaching the gospel. It meant a crier going out at dusk and yelling in and screaming out through the streets the news for the day. They didn't have newspapers, they didn't have the internet, they didn't have television. A crier would go out through the city. He says, we're crying out. We're passionately telling you the news in which you received and in which you stand, we stand, by which you are being saved. Now, that may be confusing to you because certainly Jesus dying on the cross for our sins, we receive him into our heart, we're forgiven of everything that we've ever done. 
And so we're saved from the penalty of sin the very moment that we receive Christ. But as a believer, I am being saved from the power of sin in my life. I'm, I'm not perfect. I'm still growing. You're still growing. We're constantly being saved. So he's saying to the Corinthians this, you're growing in the Christian life. If you are growing, those who are being saved, if you hold fast to the word, I preach to you unless you believed in vain. If you are not, it's basically saying, hey, if you're not growing, if Jesus has not changed your life, then uh, you believed in vain. In other words, you only believe mentally. It hasn't changed your life. For I delivered to you as first importance. Somebody asked, well, what's the most important thing in the Bible? This is it. First importance, what I received that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And so what happened? We could read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all three, all four of these uh, gospels, and we've been going through even now the gospel of John, and we can discover that there is a story of the resurrection of Jesus Christ in every single gospel. And all of them say the same thing. The grave was empty on the third day. An angel announced to Mary Magdalene, he is not here, he has risen. So what do we know for sure, not only biblically, but historically, that happened to Jesus, this, this person of, from Nazareth? We understand that he was, he was arrested after his res, uh, arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was beaten with a cat of nine tails 39 times. Now, the cat of nine tails was usually a rod, sometimes made of wood, with leather straps going out from it. Nine leather straps with little pieces of metal or bone at the end, and they would stick it to a man's back and pull it down. Sometimes they would just beat him with it and allow all of those nine uh, sharp objects to go into the back. It's been said that somebody beaten about 39 times was near death, and it is believed that Jesus was beaten 39 times. Then he was nailed to a cross, a spear in his side, two Roman executioners pronounced him dead. He was wrapped up in cloth like a mummy, sealed in a tomb, a Roman seal, very important. Nobody can break a Roman seal unless it's, it's going to be worthy of death. A Roman seal was placed over the tomb. The stone was rolled away three days later. The tomb was empty, and the body was never discovered. The body was never found. Now, we know that those things happen, but does that really mean that he rose from the dead? And what difference does that, why is it a difference maker today? Well, of course, everything that Jesus did in the resurrection proved he was God. John 1, 1, 1, 14 talks about that. In other places, Hebrews 1, over and over and over again, he said, I and the Father are one. He proves he is God. It proves that what he did on the cross was real for us, that the Son of God died on the cross for our sins. Everything he taught was true. And so as we look at this, we understand it was the message of the disciples. The first message in Acts chapter 2, the only message of the book of Acts was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It was a central theme of the early church. It was the reason for the church getting started in the first place. And it's the reason for our hope. A reason for our hope that when we, we attend a funeral, a memorial service, and the pastor gets up and talks about the afterlife and reading the book of Revelation, it's our hope. Now, just because it's our hope, just because we want to see mom and dad again, or that child that died young, does not necessarily make it true. So the question is not only what happened, but did it happen? Well, look in verse uh, 4. In fact, I'll just go back up to verse 3. For they delivered to you as first importance what was I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised again on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas. That's Peter. Then to the twelve, the other twelve disciples. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. That, that is, they've died. So, here we find the disciples going to, going to the mat for this belief. And there was no one that I can read about. You know, I'm not, I'm not a historian. I don't know everything. I haven't read everything. I can't find anything that where anyone doubted the resurrection of Jesus Christ until the Enlightenment period. I mean, what was that? I don't know, 16th, 17th century, maybe 18th century, really? No one doubted that. In fact, the popular, there for a while, short while, the swoon theory, uh, Schoenfield's book, The Passover Plot, 
written just 50 years ago, came out and said, oh, he really didn't die. He swooned. He fainted. He was in the tomb. And three days later, he took off all that mummy stuff and and uh, the cloth off his face, and he had enough strength somehow after not drinking water or having any food for three days and bleeding and get beat with a cat of nine tails, spikes going through his hands and feet. Somehow he got up and rolled away the stone, walked away, just walked away. Obviously, many of you have not heard of that theory because it never gained any ground. That would be kind of ridiculous to think about. Another theory is that they all hallucinated. Well, that would mean that 500 people hallucinated at one time. I don't know any time in history that's ever happened, or anybody claimed it ever happened. So what are the alternatives, really? Getting down logically, the alternatives are is he, he, the, someone stole the body out of the tomb, or he was resurrected on the third day. There's only two choices. Now, if someone stole the body, you have to ask yourself the question, well, who would steal the body. Well, it either have to be the enemies, the foes, or the friends, right? Either the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees that wanted Jesus, Jesus dead, and all through the Gospel of John, we've been studying that, how it built up over and over and over again. He claimed to be God in the flesh, and they couldn't stand that. No man could be God, and they wanted him to arrest him and kill him. They wanted to kill him. It says so in the Bible. And so, what about them? Well, if it was them, they had opportunity. They could bribe the guards or whatever and, and uh, speak to Rome. They had that kind of clout and maybe get the guards off. They had the opportunity, but why would they do it? What would be the motive to them doing that? I mean, they had killed Jesus. They had ended it. It looked like they had ended any threat to their authority, any threat whatsoever. They killed the movement before it started. If they stole the body, it would just ignite the whole group of people again. Why would they do that? Oh, maybe they did it so they could, they could then expose their movement by producing the body later. The problem is they never found the body. They never produced the body. And so there was no motive there. On the other hand, the disciples, you say, had the motive, but they didn't have the opportunity. They had no influence with the Roman government. They could not bribe the guards. I'm not sure they had the money to bribe the guards. And so what we find is that the disciples are going into that situation with a tomb guarded by at least two Roman soldiers, and the penalty for going to sleep on guard duty is to be drawn and quartered. One hand, one horse tied onto this hand and foot, another one on this hand and foot, and both say, giddy up, you know, and, and they go their separate directions, and your body is divided. Limbs begin to be torn off. And so Going to sleep on guard duty, well, that is probably not likely at all. But they'd have to plan for it. Well, let's just wait and see if they go to sleep. Then they'd have to sneak in, roll away the stone very quietly, get Jesus' body out of the tomb, and then what? What would they do? You say, well, they would have then their victory. They would start preaching all this falsely. Well, why should they do that, first of all? And secondly, why would they die for it? We read through history, and, and actually in the Bible we read James um, was stoned to death, the book of Acts. We read in history where Peter, at least rumored, was ups, uh, crucified upside down at request because he didn't feel worthy to be crucified the same way his Savior was crucified. John was the only one that survived among the disciples, and he was exiled on the island called Patmos, and that's where he wrote the book of Revelation. And so you say, well, the people have died for their faith before. Yes, but in every case in history, people, especially this large group of people, large as, as this, this, this group of people, when they died, they believed that what they died for was true. I say to you that if they stole the body, then they died for something they knew was false. No motive. Why would they do it? And so we have, a, we have a question here. Either he, the body was stolen or the alternative is the resurrection. Lee Strobel, who uh, once wrote for the Chicago Tribune, was an atheist. His wife was an atheist. But his wife began to go to a Bible study and then to church and finally received Christ into her life. And he looked at that as a threat. He said, you know, this is going to really divide my marriage. And Jesus is going to come between me and my wife. And so he went to a friend of his who uh, knew something about the Bible 
I believe it was a, a Christian, and he asked himself, he asked him the question, if I wanted to go about disproving Christianity, where would I begin? He said, well, that's easy. You begin with the resurrection. If you can disprove the resurrection, all of it, this is his word, falls like a house of cards. All of it goes away. None of it's real. And so he traveled the country, not only personally, but on the phone, doing his research in libraries, interviewing historians, scholars, not only biblical, but philosophical, theological scholars all over America. And he came to this conclusion. If we were holding a trial to determine the facts concerning the resurrection, and if we were to call to witness every, every witness who personally encountered the resurrected Jesus, and we exam, cross-examined them for only 15 minutes. Now, each person, each witness, 15 minutes. And if we went around the clock without a break, we would be listening to firsthand testimony, eyewitness te testimony, for more than 128 hours. That's five days' worth of testimony. Who could possibly walk away unconvinced? The stories, they are too close. The written history is too strong to deny what they saw and what they experienced. Now, how do we know? How do we feel? What are the evidences of this resurrection being true? Well, first of all, what I just said, the tomb was empty. But secondly, those, as the tomb was empty, as Jesus walked out, people saw Jesus. There were over 500 at one time. So we also see that Christ was seen alive. We read about it, Cephas in verse 12, then verse uh, six. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time. And most of all, st most are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James. That's the brother of Jesus. Then to all the apostles, last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me, says the apostle Paul. 500 plus, at least 500 eyewitness accounts. Not 500 years later, Suddenly they, they wrote it down. Not legends, not fairy tales, not embellished stories. Eyewitness accounts 15 years after the resurrection. The book of Mark, 20 years after the resurrection. Now, how important is that? Well, let me, let me give you an example. We had, back in 08, 09, we had a recession here in this country. Do you remember that? Many of you remember that. If you were alive then and... and uh, at least going to elementary school, you, you remember that. You, you know that people lost their jobs. You know that we lost value in our home. I mean, tremendously lost value in our home. Churches were hurting. Businesses were, were going under. Now, I'm, I'm here to tell you that that never happened. I wonder if I were to tell you that. That was all propaganda. It never happened. We never had a recession in this country. That was just all bad news that people were just trying to convince you of. You say, well, that's impossible. I was here then. In fact, it got so bad that I had to take a second job here. I tried out for the New York Giants football team at quarterback. And you may have remembered the 2008, 2009, I think 2008 Super Bowl where I threw that pass to David Tyree and he made that, what we call the helmet catch, that tremendous, miraculous catch to win the Super Bowl. Do you remember that? He said, well, now wait a minute, Master, that was Eli Manning. No, it was not. That's just Manning propaganda. That's all it is. It was me. I'm the one that threw that pass. He said, well, I know that's not true. How do you know it's not true? Well, let's see, I saw it on TV. I saw it on television. In fact, millions of people saw that on television, wait, wait a minute, it was on TV? Some of you were there? Oh, well, I, I can't claim that anymore. If this was not true, he says, go back and get the 500 witness accounts. They're, they're still alive today. If you don't believe what I'm saying, you go back and talk to one of those witnesses. You say, well, yeah, but they were more gullible back then. They weren't as smart as we are. Did you know there's no empirical evidence whatsoever that our IQs have grown over the centuries at all? So they're more gullible, they're more, more likely to believe in miracles. Well, the Jewish people did believe in miracles, and they, except for the Sadducees, that's why they were sad, you see. And 
believe it. <laughs> anyway, most of the Jews did believe in miracles, but they did not believe in someone being resurrected until the last days. Not only that, but they did not believe a man could be God. The last people on the face of the earth in that day that would believe that a man could become God would be the Jewish people. So I ask you, how much would it take, if you don't believe in the resurrection, how much evidence would it take you to believe it? That's how much evidence it took for them to believe it. What about James? Man, he's the brother of Jesus. How much would it take for you to believe that your brother was the Son of God? Probably a lot. You see, we see the witnesses, the 500 plus witnesses, but not only was Christ alive and the grave was empty, but I also would say that we have another evidence, and that is that people's lives were changed. In verse 5 or verse 6, it says 500 witnesses. Why were they witnesses? They were still talking about it. Their lives were changed. You know a people's lives have been changed. We could look in the Bible, say the apostle Peter was a profane fisherman. Boy, he got his life turned around and Jesus filled his heart and he became the, one of the greatest Christians to ever live. Apostle Paul struck blind on the road to Damascus and Jesus changed his life. We can look at, but you, you know, you know people whose lives you cannot explain. Maybe not a lot of them. But you know people that you can say, yeah, their life was really changed. I didn't knew them back in high school. I knew them back in college. I knew them then. They came into work one day, and oh, man, it was like so different. I had a friend of mine that was on the Georgia football team back when I was uh, going to school, and he was uh, the biggest partier there. I mean, he, he was really going down a road where he would be dead within just a few years. In fact, he fell out of a pickup truck drunk, and they had to take handfuls of gravel out of his back that bad. He shows up after a summer, after receiving Christ in his heart with a Bible in his hand, and his best friend, his former roommate, just fell in the floor laughing because he thought it was a big joke. He just took, that whole thing just took the, the whole uh, dormitory, sports dormitory at the University of Georgia, and revival broke out because they saw one man whose life was really changed. The testimony of others. So what, is this, what should this mean to us today? Well, it certainly should mean that Jesus Christ is God, that he's come in the flesh, but it also, listen to me very careful, it means the word of God can be trusted. It's true. Now, this is something personal to me. I came to a time in my life where, like maybe some of you, I felt like I was praying something in the will of God. God didn't answer that prayer the way I wanted it to be answered. And I I didn't get mad at God. I just started wondering, well, maybe Thomas Jefferson was right. He's a deist God. He just made the world and took off. Maybe that's it. And I started playing with things. I said, how do I know? How do I know that my sins have been forgiven? How do I know that the cross was applied to me? The resurrection. I, I just couldn't disprove it. Suddenly, all the arguments came into my mind. I said, okay, God, you want a relationship with me. How do I know that? How do I know you want a relationship with me? I mean, it's foreign to every other religion in the world that an all-powerful, almighty, separated God would want a relationship with us. And so maybe that was true. But I looked at the resurrection. I said, well, if the resurrection is true, then Jesus Christ did die on the cross for my sins. And if he died on the cross for my sins, if he went to that link's to provide a way for me to go to heaven, then God does somehow, some way, for some reason, want a relationship with me. If he does, then he has to communicate with me. There's no relationship without communication. There's none. Husband, wife, children, parents, nothing. How does he communicate? Well, it could be through an audible voice, but I've never heard that. So what, he did, what does he do? He gives us the Word of God. And the Bible tells us that this book, so vital, all of Christianity stands on a person, Jesus Christ, a book, the Bible, that tells us about Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that event that happened. This proclamation, all Scripture is breathed out by God. It is it's the breath of God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. What are you doing? What are we doing with the Word of God? Have we embraced the resurrection by communication with God, by reading His Word, 
Bill Ricketts, who was my former pastor at Prince Avenue Baptist Church, tells a story about being engaged to Darla, his future wife. He goes off to camp. She writes him a five-page letter. He takes that, smells of it, wonderful perfume, puts it under his pillow, and doesn't read it all week. Comes up to her and says, well, honey, I want you to know I really appreciate the five-page letter. Man, it smells really good. But here, I didn't have time to read it. And you say, wow, and they still got married? Yeah, they did because it never happened that way. He goes back and corrects himself. Oh, he says, oh, no, I, I tore it open, and I read every, every word of it, memorized it almost, because I loved her. But some of us are getting get before heaven and say, God, I really appreciate this. It's a big book, and it took a lot of time to inspire people to write it. And it's good stuff, good teaching, but here, I didn't have time to read it. I don't even know what it says. God's Word. God's communication to us. And that communication is that he does want us to have, secondly, a relationship with you. Look, in, I'm going to skip ahead to verse 13 and 14. Um, it tells us in the scriptures here in this passage, it says, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. Now he's getting to his point about our own resurrection. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching, our heralding is for nothing. It's vain. And our faith is vain. We have no faith. Our belief system and everything that we believe in is for nothing without the resurrection. And he says, we have even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise. If it is not true, then the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Listen, he's saying, look, your faith is real because the resurrection is real. I want, God says, I want to have this relationship with you. How does he do that? Well, the resurrection proves what he did at the cross, and what he did at the cross was pay for our sins. Everyone here is a sinner separated from God. The Bible says that. For all of sinning comes short of the glory of God. If we were to be honest with ourselves in some way, somehow, we've broken probably all the Ten Commandments. You know, Jesus said even to hate your brother without a cause is like committing murder. The Bible tells us that we're not bear, bear false witness. Have you ever lied before? Don't covet what your neighbor has. Have you ever wanted and coveted something somebody else had? Have you ever lusted in your heart? Have you ever uh, disobeyed God about the Sabbath day and keeping it holy? Oh, hey, and here's the big one. Have you ever worshipped something ahead of God? Put something else in first place. First commandment. We, we've broken them all. And if this was my life and here was my problem, if this book, rather, this Bible was a book of my sins in heaven and this was my life, here's my problem. But Jesus Christ came whole and clean and perfect and he died on the cross for my sins. And because of that, I can have a relationship with him. How can I do that? Thirdly, because our sins have been forgiven. How do we know that? Well, if you had, you did a crime and you went to prison for it and they let you out of prison because you had served your time, how would you know that debt has been paid? You would know because you're out of prison. And when Jesus Christ was in that grave and that grave opened up and that tomb, a stone was rolled away and he came out out of that grave, that showed right then our debt, our debt of sin had been paid. My dear friend, everybody wants forgiveness. And if you feel like you don't need it, boy, you know, you're not being honest with yourself. You heard the story about, uh, the old story, uh, short story Ernest Hemingway wrote about his dad, about this man and his son, Paco. And they had a, they had a fight. Paco did some wrong things. They had a fight about it. Paco takes off. He hadn't seen his son now in years. He'd been searching all of Spain for his son, Paco. He had given up hope. Finally, he just wrote an article and an ad in the paper, the Madrid paper. He said, Paco, if you're still alive, you're still in Spain, please, please meet me on the steps of the capital of Madrid on such and such a day at such and such a time. All is forgiven. The man showed up on that day at that time, and on the steps of the capital of Madrid were 800 Pacos, wanting forgiveness from their dad. We all want it. 
You say, well, how do I know? Listen, you, you don't understand, Pastor. I, I can understand Jesus forgiving me all the sins of the, of the past, but now that I'm a Christian, boy, I, I just keep doing wrong things. Listen, when, you, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, all your sins were in the future. All of them were. He died for all of them, past, present, and future. I, I'm, I'm now being saved from the power of sin in my life, and so are you. We're still not perfect, but you've been forgiven of everything. In fact, the greatest gift God offers to you today, you can be forgiven of everything that you've ever done. And because of that, the fourth thing, you have a hope of heaven. You have a hope that one day we can all be with Jesus in heaven. The Bible tells us in, uh, in uh, verse 19 of uh, chapter 15, it tells us that, um, I'll come to it in just a minute, it says, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are all people most to be pitied. He says in verse 26, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. He says in the in-between verses, Christ came, he was the first fruit, verse 20. And now we all follow him into heaven. That's why those promises, John 14, if I go to prepare a place for you, Jesus said, I'll come again and receive you unto myself. I'll receive you. I've got a mansion waiting for you. How do you get there? Well, later in that chapter, he said, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. How do we place our faith in him? How do we have that meaning in life? Hey, listen, how we look at the future. Tim Keller said this, our choices and character are greatly affected by what we believe our future holds. If you're only living for the now, there's not going to be any meaning. You're going to get to heaven just like I was preaching last week with Arthur, Arthur Miller's story. Up there in heaven, you're going to think, wow, there, there's no judge. There's no accountability. There's no reward. Why was I even living? Meaning to life, purpose of life, hope in the afterlife comes right here. He says in verse 20, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who've fallen asleep, that is, died. For as a man came by death, by a man came also the resurrection of the dead. And verse 23, each in his own order, Christ first, the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. The first fruits is Jesus Christ himself. All of us will follow. There's a hope of seeing that child again. There's a hope of seeing your mom, your dad again. Everyone who has ever named the name of Jesus Christ will be there waiting for you. How do you get there? Jesus said, I am the way. John 14, 6, right after that heaven stuff. I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Dear friend, your sins can be forgiven. Your sins can be washed away by receiving Christ in your heart. R Rollo May said, and I quote again, I was seized with a spiritual reality that would, what would it mean for our world if he had truly risen? What would that mean to you if you truly embraced forgiveness, forgiving yourself, forgiving others, embracing the Word of God, re re embracing the reality of Christ into your life? And what would it mean for you that have never received Christ? What would that mean that you would embrace Jesus, His cross, His resurrection, and Jesus Christ would come Forgive your sins and come into your life. If you've never experienced that, if Jesus Christ has not saved you, if Jesus Christ does not live in your heart and you are growing toward him, I would invite you to make that decision today. The Bible simply says it's, it's easy. It's easy. It's simple. Maybe simple is a better term. As many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the children of God. Whosoever shall call, that is pray, on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Would you like to be saved this morning? I, I want you to be saved. I want you to experience Jesus as I've experienced him. Would you pray with me now? In the quietness of this moment, heads bowed and eyes closed, as Christians are making their commitments to him, and about reading the Bible maybe, or, or embracing his church, embracing prayer, your relationship with God, embracing forgiveness. You that have never received Christ, would you pray this prayer with me right now? I'll pray it out loud. You can pray it silently. And the words are, are important, but it's more the condition of your heart. 
Are you to the point of humility, the point of surrender? Surrender it all to Jesus today, every sin. Pray with me right now. Lord God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for going to the cross and dying there for my sins. Thank you for your resurrection, the miracle that proves it all. I open up my heart and I ask you for that miracle of forgiveness. Forgive me of all my sins. Come into my life. Help me to walk with you starting now. God, I pray that each one that prayed that prayer with me would have an assurance in their heart that they would know, they would know beyond any doubt that if they were to die right now, they'd go to heaven. That they have a relationship with you right now. I pray, God, that you would speak to their heart and let them know that. And then they would let us know about their decision. In Christ's name, amen.